Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Festival of Ideas Online. My name's Andrew Kelly from Festival of Ideas. It's a great honor today to have with us Sarah Chase, who lived in Afghanistan for a decade, was a special assistant to US Chief of Defense, Admiral Mike Mullen, and has researched corruption networks across the world at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She's the author of Thieves of State, Why Corruption Threatens Global Security, and now everybody knows Corruption in America, which is published by Hearst Publishers. It's a great honor to have you also join us today. Do put your questions in the Ask a Question section of the website. Do join the chat and let us know where you're from. And also we'll be putting in the chat links to other readings and other events. Uh, my name's Andrew Kelly from Festival Ideas. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us from the United States. Thank you, Andrew. It's a real pleasure and an honor for me too. You, you spent a decade combating corruption, researching corruption. And although this book is called Corruption in America, which is the main focus of the discussion, it also covers other countries you've worked in, uh, researched in Nigeria, Afghanistan, Honduras, Tunisia, and Egypt. And for you, corruption is the biggest threat to democracy, isn't it? Not just democracy, I have to say. I actually think that corruption, if you dig just a little bit, you know, and think about almost any of the major crises that our world, that our society is facing, you'll find corruption underneath it somehow, be it, you know, mass migrations out of the global south, be it environmental devastation, be it, frankly, even um, global health emergencies, including, including coronavirus. Not that corruption caused it, but corruption, I think, has certainly exacerbated it in a number of countries, including my own. Um, and that was true of Ebola. You know, the Ebola crisis was, was rendered so much worse by the collapse of public health systems throughout, you know, the, the worst hit countries. And again, coronavirus, I mean, the United States of America is doing terribly in terms of overall containing of the virus, um, death statistics, um, uh, disruption, economic disruption, whereas we're one of the, you know, richest countries in the world. And that is due to, I believe, the grip that kleptocratic networks have on this country. And corruption, though, also in terms of democracy does lead to disenchantment with politics and disengagement, doesn't it? Definitely. And, 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 Definitely. And when you looked at, for example, you compared Afghanistan with America, how it draws citizens to, to extremes of politics as well. That's exactly right. Uh, what I found in Afghanistan, which really came as a surprise to me, I did not go there. I went there planning to do some reconstruction like any other development you know, practitioner to help with rebuilding this country that had been so devastated um, over the prior, previous decades. I did, did not plan to focus on corruption. It was Afghans who brought that issue to me. Um, and what I found to my amazement was that what was driving my neighbors back into the arms of the Taliban, which they had detested, believe me, even in conservative Southern Afghanistan, what was driving them back toward the Taliban was not so much some cultural or ideological uh, view of religion and Western culture, but rather was their indignation at the corruption of the Afghan government and the very apparent to them role of the international community, in particular the United States, in facilitating and enabling that corruption. That was a stunner to me. That was not at all what I expected to find. And so then later, I, you know, I began to look, as I started doing research about this, <clears throat> I began to look at other countries that had violent insurgencies or in the Arab Spring were undergoing dramatic upheavals. And I found that corruption lay at the root of all of those quote unquote extreme reactions. So that, you know, in Northern Nigeria, I was speaking to highly educated, very dignified and constructive people 
who said that in the beginning, they actually supported Boko Haram, the, the terrorist group in Northern Nigeria, initially because it was going after the police. And um, the police were almost the, I don't know, the epitome of corruption that everyone was suffering in Nigeria. Of course, these people, you know, regretted that initial support for Boko Haram, but it was quite striking to me. And I learned a lot about, about how Boko Haram was able to garner a lot of support in the beginning. Now, I want to come on um, to some of the specific examples, and particularly the United States in a moment. But one of the really valuable parts of this incredibly important book, I must say, is which I do urge people to read, is how you situate this within a history, mm. anthropology, a sociology, whatever we call it, of both money and networks, and both mm. are key points for me. I mean, just starting with money, I mean, mm. in a way, the saying that it's the root of all evil is one we, we've commonly used, but it certainly does seem to be a, a major problem in how we value things and how we value each other. That's the perfect way of framing it. Thank you, Andrew. We all need money. We all like money. Um, we all aspire to have enough, you know, to live on. Our period uniquely um, is one in which money has come to define our social standing. In other words, we don't any longer see money primarily as a means to the end of a comfortable and dignified life. Rather, we increasingly see it as the mark of how well we're doing relative to our neighbors or whatever. And, and what's very dangerous about that is it ma makes it a race with no finish line. There is no such thing as enough when money is a yardstick because however much you know your competitor has, you need to have more. And that means you're willing to sacrifice almost anything to this acquisition of money. And it means you reduce other things of great value, intrinsic value, sometimes immaterial value. You reduce those to money. And that's why I, I went back to the myth of Midas, uh, who's sort of an archetypical, um, you know, um, exemplar of this um, compulsion to have gold in that case. It was the mythical king that everything he won a, a gift from the god Dionysus and everything he touched turned to gold. And immediately he realized that this was not a gift, it was a curse. And he would die very shortly if he couldn't even drink water because it would turn to gold. Well, when I did some research, I discovered that there was a Midas. In fact, Midas is likely to have been a royal title or a, or a leadership title in an area in Anatolia that, you know, it's Phrygia and Lydia, they were neighboring, you know, principalities or whatever you want to call them at that, at that time. And fascinatingly, I found that he, or around his time, came the invention of money. Money meaning coins, whose commercial or trade value was independent of their intrinsic value, meaning the weight and precise composition of the metal was irrelevant to their value. Instead, it was the identical shape and the stamp on the surface. That is the invention of money. And so when you think of the myth of Midas that way, it's a whole different story. And I found that extremely enlightening. And, um, and then in that chapter, I discuss a little bit about how the great Athenian thinkers, both uh, philosophers and, you know, dramaturge, um, were really wrestling with this new invention of money. It was very much changing their entire social structure. And, and, and what's interesting also, going back even a little bit further, is human egalitarianism. It's extraordinarily unique among primates. 
our closest relatives, chimpanzees, have some proto-egalitarian tendencies, you know, like their alpha male will sometimes get ganged up on by, for example, often a group of females, actually, in a group if he's egregiously playing favorites. But in general, primates are very hierarchical. Human hunter-gatherers, it turns out, are not. They are highly egalitarian, which is a revolution in our you know, larger group. And the way they imposed egalitarianism for 150,000 years at least was, again, to join together in coalitions in order to slap down the sort of you know, would-be alpha dominator or anyone who was snatching more than his fair share of collectively hunted meat. And that is why we as a species are always struggling between these two tendencies, a hierarchical tendency and an egalitarian tendency. And the fact is it takes a cross-cutting coalition of um, ordinary egalitarians to bring our meat hogs in check, into check. And unfortunately, at the moment, our meat hogs are very well organized into a counter coalition, a sort of dominator coalition. And that's the situation we're in. And, and so we're confronted with the need to build a cross-cutting egalitarian coalition. And of course, what we're up against is very powerful identity divides. I thought it was very interesting how you, you asked a group of people about who are the kind of the money lenders now. And they, you know, they talked about the banks, the credit card companies, um, big pharma as well, I think, and yes. also politicians and so on. But, but in addition to the money, there's also their ability to organize themselves very effectively in networks to network uh, very widely. And you give many examples of that, perhaps the most current one for, for certainly people here who we read about quite a lot now is is Epstein and what he oh, yeah. did in, in terms of that, but also people like Madeleine Albright you talk about and so on. I mean, how, um, but one of the things I wanted to talk to you about this was you use again an aspect from Greek mythology, in this case, the, the Hydra and yeah. the many headed creed. Just tell us about that and, and how that leads to the networks today. Yeah, I mean, the Hydra in mythology was this many headed, as you, as you say, many headed, almost a kind of sea serpent that lives in a swamp, of course. <laughs> but what was, so there are a few things that are really striking about the Hydra. One is that its different heads, of course, were able to act independently. And yet, they were all working on behalf of the overall organism, which was the, the hydra. And then the other really horrific thing about the hydra is every head you cut off, two more grow. And that to me really seemed to be a metaphor for the type of network that um, I have found capturing the political economy of countries, as I say, as, as widely scattered as Honduras, Tunisia, Lebanon, um, you know, Uzbekistan, Serbia, and the United States. Um, and these networks are um, deceptive in that they cross a lot of the boundaries that certainly Americans tend to see as almost unbridgeable. For example, private sector and public sector. So in the United States, you can get into serious arguments about which is worse for your health, you know, business or government, the private sector or the public sector. Uh, these networks very skillfully weave across those boundaries. Um, they also almost always include out and out, you know, brazen criminals like mafiosi or drug traffickers or human traffickers or what have you. I would say in Afghanistan, they certainly also included um, Taliban. They include what you might call informal instruments of force. And they also span all of the identity divides that pit the potential egalitarian coalition against itself. So I was very struck to see how easily these networks span the political divide in the United States. So 
you know, the Epstein network, as you indicate, I mean, the two most high level or high profile, I would say, members of that network were President Trump and former President Bill Clinton. You know, I mean, it just and you look, you mentioned Madeleine Albright. So she is, you know, tightly wound together with the Republican head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so all of the same divisions that disable the potential egalitarian coalition are welded together within these networks. And because they have so many different um, walks of life within them, they dispose of great you know, tools and capabilities uh, that they can use in, in different ways. Now, don't get me wrong, the networks don't look exactly the same in every country. In some cases, the public sector is sort of in the lead. In other cases, the private sector is in the lead. In some cases, they're very, they're beset by a lot of internal turbulence and rivalry and whatnot. Um, but they, but they function more or less the same way. And you can think of mafia families as another sort of metaphor in that they were often rivals and allies at the same time. Okay, so the corruption you find, and you say it just takes a little digging to find, find some of this corruption, can, can have an impact not just on economies and political elections and on society and so on, but also the wider impact on, on the earth and, and, and the Absolutely. crisis we're facing now. Absolutely, no question. I mean, in the end, um, as electronically as wealth is now counted, I mean, what's so ironic is we're not even collecting, storing up gold anymore. We're storing up zeros, you know, in bank accounts, right? It's electronic signals. And yet, it all makes its way back to the earth, right? I mean, what's on the earth, what's under the earth, you have hydrocarbons, you have uh, rare earth minerals, you have logging, you have hydroelectric power, um, you have animal trafficking. I mean, so much, you have, you have high-end real estate, which is devastating habitats. Um, and so, you know, in the end, it all comes back to the earth. And so where Midas, found himself, you know, converting beautiful wheat and a, an apple or a piece of fruit that he touched, a fig that he touched, converted to gold. And in Nathaniel Hawthorne's version, he reached out and, and kissed his daughter's forehead and she turned into a gold statue. Well, today we are converting, frankly, the miracle that is our planet, the irreplaceable miracle that we still don't understand whose interconnectedness and, and, and I mean, we're just coming to understand that trees communicate to each other. We're converting that not even to gold, but to zeros in bank accounts. And then you have the other ineffable values that we're converting to gold, just like Midas's relationship with his daughter you know, we're converting human creativity, we're converting labor, we're converting love into zeros. And I think this is suicidal. And I would say the other historical point I make in Everybody Knows is a dive into the Gilded Age, which um, I believe is the last time that humanity was in the grip of systemic corruption in the same way. And that is the period, you know, of the Industrial Revolution, when we really set all of this in train. And again, looking from the from the U.S. perspective, I mean, let's not even talk about smog in London, right? Yeah. You know, but from the U.S. perspective, this was, you know, a um, significant extinction event, the near extinction of bison and wolves, the extinction of pas passenger pigeons, the near extinction of dramatic, you know, bounty of oysters and migrating fish. And it was also, I'm speaking to you from the end of four miles of dirt road in Paw Paw, West Virginia on the Capon River, um, which is the center of Appalachia, which is, well, it's, you know, the sort of yeah, mid Appalachia, 
this entire mountain range was deforested during that period. I mean, literally, you had first growth um, virgin forest was simply turned to um, wasteland during that period. And so, you know, and here we are now again in the midst of a sort of uptick of the sixth extinction, we have no idea what the impact of what we're doing is going to be. I was, I'm glad you come on to the Gilded Age because I wanted to, to ask you about that. And the, the question mm -hmm. um, in terms of what you've you've just talked about there was how, not the, just that this affected nearly every aspect of political and economic life that in terms of corruption and so on, but also the hardest hit people mm -hmm. with similar to the ones now. I mean, it's almost like a, a mirror, isn't it? And isn't what, it? You know, the working class people, you know, and also I was very struck by, you talked about, you know, opium epidemics then. Yes. Um, and then we have the opioid crisis now. Um, exactly. It's, a, it's, it's remarkable. It, it is. I mean, and I really, I honestly didn't know much about this period when I began working on the book. And, and I intended to dispatch it with a couple of paragraphs as it is often dispatched. And yet I found the parallels were so striking that I just couldn't do that. Um, I don't speak about the United Kingdom as much, um, obviously, as the United States and indeed as France, where I've lived for a long time. So that is another, in, you know, sort of international example that I provide. But the fact is that the Gilded Age syndrome was universal in the industrialized world. And that also struck me hard because what it meant was that, you know, in the UK's constitutional monarchy, in the French um, Third Republic, in the German Empire, and in the, you, you know, American Democratic Republic, we had the same exact thing going on. And that was quite frightening because what it meant was that systems of government in and of themselves were not an effective bulwark against, um, against this phenomenon. Um, it needed a very specific set of reform measures, which for 70 years, you know, in both Europe and the United States were not anywhere um, on the horizon. I'll come back to those in a minute. I just wanted to talk about um, the, the the fact that there was a shift, uh, and we'll we'll talk about why that happened and the the kind of lessons for today uh, on, in that. But but I want to just move forward to to when things began to go wrong again. And and a kind of common feature of a number of things we've been talking about lately in Festival of Ideas is about the end of the seventies period. You know, the coming yes. of Mrs. Thatcher in Britain and and President Reagan in the United States. And you very cleverly, I thought, didn't just talk about that, but you talked also about cinema and culture and mm. how, um, you know, the, the film Risky Business, you know, Tom Cruise's, I think that was the right. like first film, I can't remember now, um, but certainly his breakout film anyway. And then the one that's perhaps been most common of all was Wall Street, you know, Oliver Stone's film and The Greed is Good and so on. Um, what was this shift that happened in, you know, and, and someone's asked the question about neoliberalism and, and the impact of that and so on. I mean, this this shift was was not just significant in the UK or, or America. It was around the world, wasn't it? Yes, and I think it starts with money again. I think the first phase of that shift, and it is so strikingly captured in risky business. Of course, Wall Street is much more explicit, but if you look at risky business and you see, you'll see that, you know, the sort of decent, comfortable, earned, livelihood of Cruz's parents is utterly ridiculed. I mean, they are just appalling. They're domineering. They're tight-assed, excuse me for using a rude right. word, you know. Um, you just loathe everything about them. And Tom Cruise is um, nubile. He's sort of, I want to say, um, awkwardly sexy. Like, he's a bit awkward, but he clearly comes into his own, and there's this incredible underpants-clad Elvis dance routine and all of this. Um, and he gets together with a gorgeous prostitute, and they um, make a killing renting out um, 
his parents' house as a brothel. Uh, he gets into Princeton because the Princeton, you know, interviewer comes to interview him and walks out with a girl, right? So what it's basically saying is that by being criminal, you can uh, end appealing to people's, I want to say, um, I don't want to say baser instincts, but I'm tempted to say that, but it's more like their desire for instant gratification. Um, you can make it really big. And not only do you make a ton of money, but you walk off with the girl and the Princeton admission. So criminal pursuit of great wealth is suddenly made cool for a whole generation of teenagers, you know? And I graduated from college in 1984. So this was just when that movie was coming out and already it was hitting that new. Um, so most of my classmates went and joined the financial services industry because making money was the thing to do, was the cool thing to do. And so that was the first phase, I think, in the shift, was the glorification of money for its own sake. Once you do that, then kleptocracy is inevitably going to follow. And that's what happened by, I would say, the mid-1990s. The next really important shift was um, just the breakout of kleptocratic networks across the world, beginning in the former Soviet Union, frankly, but really reaching all the way across the world. And that was because once money is the ultimate objective, then, and criminality to get it is deemed as cool, then you, um, then the next, next thing to do is figure out how best to rig the system to allow a networked coalition of dominators to get more money than anybody else. And so, yes, neoliberalism is very much a part of that because it's about dismantling all of the protections that were built up at the end, you know, I would say in the late 1930s and the 1940s um, that were fought for. None of them came easily, they were fought for, but those were the protections that had kind of slapped down our collective meat hogs during that post-war period. Now, one of the issues about is, is what we do about this. We're in a new gilded age now. You, you say it's significantly uh, uh, as as bad, if not worse, than it was in the the late eighteenth and nineteenth century. When this happened before, and in the when we came into the nineteen thirties, you had people like Franklin Roosevelt take the presidency and so on. It actually took a war uh, to to change this. Very significant in Britain, the, the shift that happened there. But it, before this. There were various things, weren't there, in the United States, like, you know, the protests in cities, as well as, you know, reading about things like the Farmers Alliance and the growth of a new populist party and so on. I mean, what what really the key thing is, is what do we do about it? What do we need now? And um, and one of the things you've talked about is how we really must not just think about and talk about the kind of society we want to live in, but also realise the massive labour that's needed to to, to change this? Uh, that was also a tremendous discovery for me, was those protest movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I mean, we had heard in this country about strikes, again, having lived in Europe for such a long time, of course, those uh, industrial era strikes were very well known to me. I had spent quite a bit of time with dock workers in, in Marseille, in France, and they have a or had, you know, a very proud history back to those days that they still remembered all of those dock workers who became my friends in the early 1990s. Their fathers and grandfathers had, you know, had to, they said they had to strike to get bathrooms on the docks so that they could relieve themselves, you know, with dignity. I mean, everything that they had gained, it was with their you know, grandfathers, um, and, and, and I know that strikes have gotten a rather worse reputation of late, but if we think back to what people were striking for back then, I mean, it was basic human dignity. And what I found very interesting was it wasn't just conceived of in strictly material terms. It really was about what what is it to be human? And so the strike, the movement for the eight hour day, for example, was not just about needing rest. 
it was eight hours to work, eight hours to rest, and eight hours for what we will. And education was a very important part of it. They were, you know, we need the time to study and inform ourselves. We need the time to, you know, to make theater, to make art, to make culture, to play football, you know. It was very much about what a well-rounded and dignified human life is about. And I was I was very struck by that. The Farmers Alliance here in the United States was something I had never, honestly never heard of, I have to be honest. I couldn't believe it. I mean, these people in their far-flung homesteads across, you know, oceans of prairie and what have you were meeting in little schoolrooms, they were driving their covered wagons to schoolrooms and they were getting instruction by traveling lecturers. And they, their put, you know, uh, perspective or, or desired reforms were incredibly sophisticated. They were taking on the monetary system. They were taking on, you know, collective purchase of raw materials and, and, and collective um, wholesaling to the United Kingdom and to Germany. Um, of their wheat and other products. I mean, you know, direct election of senators, universal suffrage, um, I, I mean, incredibly sophisticated uh, reforms, and they basically got nowhere. I mean, that's what was incredibly terrifying about this research was for 70 years, of concerted efforts that were being slapped down in every conceivable way by the dominating coalition. I mean, they really got nowhere. There was some legal reforms in the progressive era in the United States. And again, I think in, in the UK, there were, there were parallels, but basically it got nowhere until, and you said a war, and that's the title of a chapter, but in fact, it wasn't a war, it was two wars. It was the First World War and the Second World War and the Great Depression and a pandemic that puts today's COVID pandemic, I mean, you know, it makes it look like a sneeze by comparison, two genocides, mass starvation in Europe. That's what it took for the degree of solidarity that is very striking, you know, in England. I mean, England under the Blitz, Americans were stunned to discover that people were happy and they were helped. The degree of solidarity was amazing. It's not that they weren't suffering trauma, but everyone found something to do. Everyone was helping each other regardless of race or accent or, or, or social class in, in the United Kingdom, you know? And so there is a body of work that grew out of that experience, looking at disaster as a catalyst for remarkable reforms in politics and social structure. Now, that's a lot of disaster. That's a lot of disaster. And so what I am urging us is to try to find that disaster solidarity feeling. You know, it's really the meaning of the, quote, moral equivalent of war. We need to find the moral equivalent of war to band together across all of our cultural and political divides in order to take on this kleptocratic network that is manipulating all of us into letting it stay or networks to letting them stay in charge. I want to bring in another audience question now, yeah. but just, but just in terms of um, some of the, I mean, you talk about a lot of things that, that we can do, you know, on our own personal responsibility, um, that, you know, checking what's going on in your own neighborhood through to, you know, debating the importance of ideas, even shifting culture. I did love, by the way, the idea of, of a new series called Public Integrity Squad rather than the, the murders and the crime and so on. Right, one, right. The public Integrity Squad. But also questioning things like, you know, when the Sacklers who, um, you know, produce the help produce the opioid crisis have been funding all our museums around the world, which is now there's a big backlash against that in the UK as well, where the name is Bravo is being, to the National Portrait Gallery. Yeah, being taken down, and also our ethical choices. We're also going through to to revalue, you know, how we revalue, how we re reassess what our values are through through different measurements than than GDP and so on. But one thing I just wanted to ask you about before asking that other audience question member was about 
where we are now in and, mm. and in in the United States, and you you know you've got an election coming up, oh, and um, and there's all sorts of issues about you know whether the sitting president will even accept the result uh, when it comes in. I mean, you know, the Herculean labour that we need to to transform where we are is not just going to be solved in one election. But what are the critical things that are going to happen this November? Do you think that that to to watch for? So I really love, Andrew, the way you frame that again. Um, uh, this situation is not the doing of one man. He, Donald Trump, in my view, is a sort of apotheosis of a phenomenon that's been building, as I said, since, you know, 1980 across political parties. One of the reasons I used mythology so much and I clung to that is because in some ways I feel that we've abandoned mythology as a source of wisdom and inspiration for understanding our own species and its place in the world. And it's got a lot of wisdom in it, you know? And so I found that, wow, we've abandoned mythology, therefore we're being obliged to live our myths. I mean, I, I commend anyone to the book um, uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. It's a tremendous book about, about the hero cycle um, through almost any folklore in the world has a, a type of rhythm of the hero cycle. And on page 11 of that book, at least the, the edition I have, he talks about Minos, uh, the mythical king of Gre Crete. Um, and he goes into a two-page tirade about Minos's psychological makeup. This book was written in 1949. It is an exact portrait of Donald Trump. And I said, oh my God, we are living our mythology today. Um, Donald Trump is not going to relinquish power voluntarily. That is not going to happen. Um, we are in for such a drastically awful November, in my view. Um, if it is a landslide in in on behalf of uh, Joe Biden, that might make it a little bit easier to get through. Uh, given the vagaries of mail-in voting, um, given the coronavirus, it is rather likely that many Biden votes will be coming in later than election day. There are a number of swing states that will not validate ballots that arrive after election day, even if they were posted before election day. President Trump has um, appointed a new postmaster, postmaster general who is canceling overtime. Postmen and women are now no letter carriers are no longer allowed to work overtime as though they are deliberately trying to slow down the mails. I mean, it is unbelievable what's happening. Um, I'm also very concerned at the Democratic pick. It seems to me to be a giant collective wish. Can't we please just wake up from this nightmare and it's 2015 again and none of this ever happened? Oh, please, please, please. And I'm like, are you fools? You know, 2015 delivered Trump to us. It was not, you know, Valhalla. Um, 2015 needed desperately a lot of reforms that had not happened. Um, people's rejection of the corruption of the American, you know, political system was akin to Afghan's rejection of 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 um, Car President Karzai's corruption. The Afghans, or some Afghans, went for a minority, went for the Taliban, just like a minority went for Trump, and it completely devastated our country. And so, 2015 is not what we should be looking back to. And oh, by the way, we can't wake up back in 2015. And so. For me, if and only if, number one, Joe Biden wins, and number two, he truly does intend to be a transitional figure and a transitional in the right direction toward a rigorously reformist future for the United States, can we hope to get out of this? But 
he has surrounded himself with a lot of people from 2015, you know, and so the indications are not very good. We will find out soon who his running mate is, and that will make a big difference. But it is going to take, as you say, Herculean effort. And the point about Hercules is even Hercules couldn't kill the Hydra alone. He needed his charioteer, Iolaus, to help him. That meant there were two different skills. Iolaus was, I think, his nephew in the story, in the tradition, and he was young and lithe. And so Achilles with his club, you know, is clubbing off the Hydra's head, but Iolaus with his cottering brand was sealing off the necks so they couldn't re-sprout. And again, metaphorically, what that's telling us is it's gonna take each of, each of us using our different skills and attributes, really banded together in a cross-cutting coalition to begin to bring these transnational networks under control. And they are transnational and UK has its share, <laughs> you know? And so what I think is really needed is number one, mass mo mobilization, number two, a serious program of reform measures that are both implemented uh, uh, in a legislative way, but also are enforced. And that's where we get to the integrity squad. We need, you know, the serious crimes uh, uh, office to be way beefed up, to have much greater incentive structures, to go after really big fish. We need, um, and we need, as you say, sort of, you know, social shaming and cult cancel culture is a very problematic aspect of our age. But if we aim it usefully uh, at these kleptocratic domineers, it can be a very powerful tool. And I think we need to look at the private sector as well as the public sector. We need to look at monopoly and the overweening power of certain corporations. And that means tech, but not only tech, it means industrial agriculture, it means mining and energy and all of those. So there are a lot of different ideas in the epilogue, but it's all about every one of us mobilizing as our gifts and capabilities draw us into this fight. Just a couple more questions which are coming from the audience before we wind up. The first is about why, why people, it's often said people vote against their own interests. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the things you've talked about is how people um, are driven to extremes, which we've seen in, in, in Britain as well as in, in the United States and, and elsewhere. What, what makes people do that? You know, why do people vote against their own interests in this way? I think because of how brilliantly the kleptocratic network is able to instrumentalize the identity divides. And so what it does is causes us to crystallize along identity affiliations. And the more we do that, the more we are forgiving of our champions, the, the, the more we do that and the more we bundle those identity groupings under a political banner, be it Tory or Labour, be it, you know, red or blue in the United States, the more we do that, the more forgiving we are, ironically, of the deviations between our political champions' policies and our desired policies. Because they represent our cultural identities, then we forgive them of their policy deviations. And you can see this, you know, with evangelicals and President Trump is, you know, in uh, sides with them on abortion or gun rights. And so they forgive a lot of other policies or even behaviors that may not correspond to their worldview. Um, so I think that is what is so 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 effectively instrumentalized by these networks. And Lebanon has been a very interesting example of that. I think the recent explosion is truly once again gathering Lebanese across these um, these uh, sectarian and other identity divides. But look at the disaster that it took, you know. And that's that's been clear from the protests over the past day or so really that we've been reading about but the second question is about is 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 how do we invest in 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 countries in, in developing countries and so on that doesn't encourage 
corruption? I mean, Boy, that are... is a fantastic question, and it's very, very, very difficult because these networks are really adept at capturing revenue streams. That's what they do. And, and foreign assistance is a terrific revenue stream. And so it means that on a personal level, you need to work to find local organizations. Um, and even those are often, you know, captured by local strongmen. So you really, really, really have to do your due diligence uh, among people you trust, whose values you trust, to see who they can recommend personally. I hate to say it, but you sort of have to build a counter network. From a national perspective, DFID and whatnot, you need to build citizens' oversight into the body of your development programs. So too often, monitoring and evaluation is, is classified as part of overhead in development projects. And then the objective is to reduce overhead so that you can you know, invest as much money as possible in the practical outcomes. Um, and that is a poor idea. Monitoring and evaluation should be a part and parcel of the program itself, including developing citizen skills in monitoring and evaluation. And finally, the last very important point is what metrics you use to measure success. So when you are delivering vaccines, you can measure success quite easily in a linear fashion in terms of how many people have been inoculated. When you're trying to achieve social change or political change, it's much less easy to measure because social and political change is not linear. It's often builds for a long time subterranean before it bursts out into something. And so you have to try to capture metrics because metrics are important, but you have to find some that more effectively um, indicate progress than the obvious linear measures. And the final question is, we've, we've talked about disaster, uh, the, the positive things sometimes that can come out of, of disaster and so on. Someone's asked about Naomi Klein's view as how disasters exactly. are used for um, for, for the, the less good reasons and Absolutely. so on. Absolutely. And, and, and what do we need to be concerned about there in terms of the crisis we're in now? Yes, disaster, solid, disaster, what is her uh, crisis? What is the title of that book? Anyway, it's a terrific insight. And here's that, 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 that's, I'm delighted to have that question because what you find, for example, in the Trump administration are a lot of people who have made their killing on what's called distressed assets. That is to say, buildings, uh, homes, um, whole swaths of industry in crisis struck countries that are being, you know, given away because they because of a disaster. Right. So people in desperate situations will undersell themselves when they have to. Right. And so and also when you have disasters, you have um, emergency spending. So you should see the free for all that is happening in this country over coronavirus relief. It is just ridiculous. You know, you have the foremost shipping company, which belongs to the family of the of the secretary of transportation, who's married to the Senate majority leader. And this is a country that is deeply ingrained in the Chinese, you know, political military establishment. This has gotten between a million and five million U.S. dollars. And so and that's not even to mention the mass purchases of corporate bonds that are going on that no one's paying any attention to in the trillions of dollars. And so these kleptocratic networks are highly organized to benefit from crisis. And this particular crisis is a terrible one because it's driving us, the potential egalitarian coalition, apart because we have to physically distance ourselves while it's providing just extraordinary opportunities for the kleptocratic networks. And so I feel that it's quite unfair that this is the crisis that has been visited upon us at this time. It's not the crisis best suited to bringing all of us together. And so we have to really keep our eyes on that and just demand oversight and not put up with it and demand answers from the people who are benefiting around the world from this. Well, thank you very much, 
Sarah Chase. Um, if you'd like to get a copy of Everybody Knows, uh, they're published in this country by Hearst Publishers. Um, there are other events online in our Democracy series, and that's on our YouTube channel. Uh, Anne Applebaum, Masha Gessen, our own MPs, and Robert Reich are all available, the recordings there now. And coming up on the 10th of September, we have Thomas Frank uh, talking about populism. And on 15th of September, Michael Sandel talking about um, meritocracy and, uh, and other issues. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Hurst and Alison at Hurst for all your help. And thank you most of all, Sarah Chase. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a great series.